Growing up with severe allergy and almost dying from it, the majority of my childhood memories were made in the metallic coldness of the hospital. However, I hold these memories dearly and I treasure them. This is because everyone from the multidisciplinary team, including the nurses and the doctors, they all took care of me with such great care. Whenever I was in the ward and they came to visit me, they always came with a smile. Whenever I felt like my body had a problem, they always came and reassured me they made me feel happy. And then they would always tell me that with the correct treatment and cooperation, I could grow up like a normal, healthy boy. They helped me through a very difficult part of my life. And that inspired me to want to have that kind of impact on someone else's life as well. Which is why I developed a passion for helping people. Growing up as a teenager, I had to watch my grandparents suffer from the symptoms of type 2 diabetes. Well, I know that everyone's childhood may not be the same, but for my case, my grandparents were a very integral part of my childhood. They were the ones that took care of me when my parents went to work. My grandmother would always cook me her famous food. My grandfather, even though he was sleeping, I would wake him up just to ask him to take me to go get ice cream. And he would always be happy to do so. They're the ones that made me who I am today. And to watch them deteriorate from being able to do Tai Chi to half a year later, bedridden, because of all these sicknesses, it struck a chord in me. And that's when I decided to pursue medicine as my career, which is why I've never been more proud to present to you my topic, which is the future of diabetes in Malaysia, in loving memory of my grandparents. So when I wanted to research this topic, I researched about the severity of type 2 diabetes in Malaysia. Because ever since I was young, I knew that Malaysia had a bad reputation for it. But what I found out shocked me. Amongst all the ASEAN countries, Malaysia has the highest rate of type 2 diabetes. Coincidentally, when I was researching this, my loving mother, she bought me some food. And after boarding in KTJ, I've found a new appreciation for the local Penang delicacy. And that was when I realized that the most important factor for Malaysia being such a high-ranking country for type 2 diabetes is confirmed food. But that is only one of the many factors that determine the quality of health in Malaysia. And these factors are known as social health determinants. So what are social health determinants? Social health determinants are, to put simply, conditions that determine the quality of health of a country. And they are responsible for the health inequities between countries. To give an example, look no further to Singapore. While our variants of food are vastly similar, and our geographical location is practically the same, our ranking in terms of health is number 49th, while theirs is number 6. Why is this so? This is because of all these different social health determinants. And the one that I'll be talking about right now, which has to do with my previous example, is upstream determinants. Upstream determinants are usually out of the individual's control. An example is government policy. To use Singapore as an example again, if I were a fat, obese kid in Singapore, I'd have to join something called a health club, and it is compulsory for me to do so. What we do there is I have to exercise, the teachers have to monitor my health, my weight, my BMI, my glucose levels, all of that. And during recess, instead of having the time to enjoy spending time with friends, having a snack here and there. I have to go to do more exercise. While that may seem cruel, it is actually very, very useful. Because as a kid, that would incentivize me to want to get rid of my weight as fast as I can, to be able to enjoy that time with my friends. 
Next up, now that I've talked about upstream determinants, I'll move on to downstream determinants. So downstream determinants are very close to the causal chain of the disease. An example of that is gastronomic culture. So a gastronomic culture is, is just a very, very fancy way of saying food. But we have to look at it at a vast variety of aspects. So the gastronomic culture in Malaysia can be simplified by my example. And, I, and this example applies to me as well. So when I go back to Penang, after studying KTJ for about one or two months, I like to meet up with my secondary school friends because I miss them. And what we usually do is we go out late night, watch a game of football at the local mamak. And at the mamak, usually what, what we order is roti canai and etare. Now, what we don't realize is these two combinations, while as affordable, as delicious as they may seem, is very, very detrimental to our health because the amount of sugar in these two combined is very, very high. And not only that, while you think that it is a luxury and it's a privilege that it is so affordable to us, if you look at it from another side, it affects the entire Malaysian demographic because it is so affordable. Another downstream determinant that I like to talk about is genetic inheritance. Well, this is a very personal aspect for me because both my grandparents and my great-grandparents, they all have type 2 diabetes. So while I was researching for this, I was doing it for my parents' sake, my siblings' sake, and for my sake as well. What I found was an eye-opener. If your parent has type 2 diabetes after the age of, before the age of, after the age of 50, you have a 1 in 13 chance of getting it. If your parents have it before the age of 50, it will be a 1 in 7 chance. And if both your parents have it, it's 50% that you might get type 2 diabetes. Now, by no means am I telling you this to ask you to stop sugar completely because we all know it is, um, is, it, it is impossible to do so. But all I want you to do is be more mindful when you eat so that you don't overindulge. Now that I've given you so many information-heavy slides, I'd like to give you a joke, at least my attempt at a joke. If your parents accidentally pass away, and they leave you with nothing but a camping site covered with fur and hair. I guess they'll be leaving you with inheritance. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> now I'd like to move on to the future because we've covered everything that has to do with why Malaysia might get diabetes and the factors behind it. Let us look at the future, which, look no further, is genomic sequencing. So to explain genomic sequencing very briefly, our DNA is made out of building blocks, which are A, G, T, and C. And for our human genome, or our DNA, there's three billion of these building blocks. And because everyone's DNA is different, the arrangement of these building blocks are different as well. So what genomic sequencing is able to achieve is scientists are able to look at our DNA displayed in that order of A, G, T, and C. And an instance where this has been proven beneficial for humans is when they discovered that there is a, mu there is a genetic mutation for sickle, cell anemia, for sickle cell anemia. So what happens is in one of the sequences, CTT is replaced by CAT. And that may seem like a very tiny mutation, but that is enough for scientists to determine whether you have sickle cell anemia or not. And because of this discovery, scientists have made an experiment to determine whether genomic sequencing can be used as a viable prediction model compared to what we have right now, which is called the clinical model. So what they do is, in terms of genetics, they take the existing people with type 2 diabetes, they sequence their genome, and define the correlations just like how they did with sickle cell anemia. 
As for the clinical model, they look at things like age, BMI, weight, and family history like I talked about before. So that is the conventional way we predict type 2 diabetes as of now. While I was really hopeful that genomic sequencing is able to achieve this high levels of prediction because it's personal to me, unfortunately that's not the case. We have to understand that sickle cell anemia is a very rare and simple case. There's one mutation to determine whether you have the disease or not. But for most cases, for example diabetes, there's a large variety of different genetic mutations that will able to contribute to whether you have a high chance of getting the disease or not. Okay. <clears throat> now that I've talked about prediction, I'd like to move on to regulation. So right now the status quo is called intermittent glucose measuring. So what you do is you take your finger and you take this glucose measuring machine, you prick your finger and through your blood they're able to determine your glucose levels. The problem with this is that you get an intermittent day set of data for your glucose levels. So what that means is you only get that data when you prick your finger. And that isn't the most ideal way to do it. And the most ideal way to do it is continuous glucose monitoring. While this hasn't really been fully implemented in Malaysia, the people in Silicon Valley has been they have been using it for quite a while because they understand the benefits of continuous glucose monitoring or CGM. So the benefits of CGM are they give you a very comprehensive representation of your data. So because it's continuously on your skin, you'll be able to look at your glucose levels in the morning, at night, after a meal, after exercise, and because of that, you'll be able to look at a very good trend as to how your glucose levels fluctuate. And that is really important because of the next point. You understand the effects of your lifestyle. Because people react to exercise and diet differently, you'll be able to look at what works the best for you. Maybe for some people, jogging is the best way to reduce their glucose levels. Maybe just for some people, it's an avocado diet. And last but not least, it gives you a more personalized version of healthcare. Because when doctors receive the set of data, <clears throat> they'll be able to properly view what works for you, what works for you, and the things that you have to do to improve your glucose levels, or how the medicine has been working for you, or whether or not you need the medicine in the future. So all these factors contribute to the benefits of continuous glucose block monitoring, and I hope in the near future, Malaysia is able to implement this. As a conclusion, type 2 diabetes will always be a problem we have to face unless we all suddenly hit the diet. In the possible future, genomic sequencing as a prediction model may improve. And last but not least, we should all implement the continuous glucose monitoring. After doing this presentation, I felt just a little bit closer to my grandparents. And I know they're not here watching me right now, but I think that they'll be proud of me. Thank you. <laughs>